everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Pass the Wire TV. I am John Stetton, one of your hosts. My co-host is Jeff Metz in beautiful, uh, sunny Southern California. I'm here in beautiful, sunny Southwest Florida. And uh, we've got an interesting weekend of racing coming up. We're going to talk about uh, a couple of things that pertain to that. And then we've got a couple of other issues that we're going to touch base on Um afterwards that I think are real interesting and, and, and important to the game. But before we get to that, how are you, Mr. Matt? Doing good, doing good. You know, uh, happy to be here. And uh, it's nice to see this weekend. We're going to have a lot of good racing this weekend. Uh, the three-year-olds are going to be in Florida as well as Oakland Park. And uh, a lot of stakes out there at Gulfstream. So you you got a, a nice Absolutely. plate, to, a nice dish uh, that you're going to have served to you on that day. You know, one of the one of the good things about racing, and 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 you know, we always get credit for the bad, get well discredit or no credit, or whatever. Well, I don't know the right phrase here, but we never get credit for the good things, you know. And and, and one of the good things is, all year long, we've got exciting racing. You know, you really when you think about it. I mean, we're in the beginning of the year now. We're in February. Um, we've got the newly turned three year olds. Uh, we've got the Kentucky Derby preps. They lead into the Kentucky Derby, the Triple Crown. You know, you know. Then before you know it, the, the Breeders' Cup races are on the horizon, and you know you've got all you know preps and key races all along the way, um, on both coasts in the Midwest in Kentucky. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, there's excitement in the sport of King Thoroughbred Racing year yeah. round. We have no off season. We have no off season. It's funny how uh, you know. Here we are, February, and people are talking about Keeneland. And then right. in March, they'll be start talking about Del Mar, you know, which right. is in July. Exactly. So exactly. it's always uh, something to look forward to a month or two down the road. So, yeah, right. definitely exciting racing ahead of us. And uh, the three-year-old picture, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a couple of good ones. But I think, I think there's still going to be some horses rise to the top as it gets closer to May. So I think there's a few out there that we haven't seen their best yet. And um, it's going to be interesting to see, because I was looking at the points leaderboard the other day and uh, I was like, boy, it wouldn't take much to bounce into this. But as right. you and I know, the, the major races with the higher points are still coming up here shortly absolutely, in the next couple absolutely. of weeks. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the way, to, the way that whole point system is structured is you just win one of those and you're in. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. so you could pop up and, and, and win one of those and you're in. And this weekend, you know, Oakland lost some time, as you know, um, due to weather, but they get essential quality, the two year old champion, Breeders' Cup winner, and early Kentucky Derby favorite, or at least one of the early Kentucky Derby favorites back on Saturday. And my question to you to start things off as a, 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 a trainer, and it's a twofold question because one I want to ask you is, how much of a setback is it when you have a three-year-old coming back off a layoff like essential quality and you're pointing for a race that was supposed to be a week or two ago and now not only do you lose the race but the track is closed due to bad weather so you know you lose some training and now you got to run right on the heels of that lost training is that a disadvantage and once you tell us and how much and once you tell me about that then i want to ask what you as a trainer look for and then I'll kind of tell you what I look for as a, as a, as a fan and a better and just a student of the game. But what do you look for in a three-year-old like essential quality or any, any high quality um, two-year-old turning three that's kind of like a derby trail or derby consideration type of horse? What do you want to see in that very first race back? So let's hear. Yeah, the, hear, 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 hear. The, the big thing is, uh, it, it is uh, very unfortunate that they missed time with training. You know, the, the track was frozen. Uh, they had snow all over and they just couldn't train. A lot of the training was in the barns, just jogging, maybe even a little galloping inside the barns. But really, they lost some training and probably some of their key works leading up to the race. So the good news for the horses coming off a layoff or in the stakes races and the three-year-olds, I would say the top tier horses they are good quality horses. So the fact that they missed some training, I don't think it's gonna hurt them as much as uh, maybe a claiming horse or an allowance horse. These are quality horses, they're stakes horses, and they've proven that they belong in these races. So I don't think it's gonna be as big a factor as it might be. 
uh, just because of the talent level. And the other thing is, it isn't a Kentucky Derby. So I think even though they might have missed some time, some workouts and some training leading up to these races this weekend in Oakland, I don't think that it's their ultimate goal. So I don't think they have to be at their peak. I think May is when they want to be at their peak. So I still think these horses coming off a layoff, um, you know, it would be more advantageous if they could have had their regular training. They could have had a workout closer to the race, which now they probably don't have time because they just, you know, uh, are getting back into training. The last day or two, I've seen horses um, on the track and training at Oaklawn as far as, you know, on, on videos and, and social media. But, um, you know, it's going it's to be tight and you don't want them to do too much before they race. You know, you don't want to work them and have them kind of leave their work out there because they were too strong and too keyed up. But um, uh, the one good thing is that these high level quality horses, things don't bother them as much as maybe a second tier horse. Interesting. Uh, and, you know, another thing I will say, Oaklawn, in my opinion, uh, and you probably would have a, a, a more knowledgeable opinion on this than I would, but, you know, from what I see, they seem to do a really good job taking care of their racetrack and, and, and having it as good as it can be day in and day out, even, even, even when they have to deal with some adverse weather and, and, and frozen conditions. And I spent a couple of years down there. Um, I don't know if you know that, but I, I, I actually, uh, stayed in hot springs for a couple of years. So I was at Oakland every day for about, mm. I don't know, maybe four or five meets in a row. Um, yeah. And I went every day and it, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting place. And I don't mean to disparage it in any way by saying this, but I called it the poor man Saratoga. <laughs> it wasn't quite Saratoga, but it's a town that completely revolves around horse racing. Uh, I mean, you know, the negative stigma that you find in some areas when it comes to horse racing, you don't find in hot springs at, at all. And I'll give you an example. If you had, let's say, a real estate agency or an insurance agency, and you were 15 minutes from Santa Anita, and every Friday at, at, at 11 o'clock in the morning, you closed because you wanted to go to Santa Anita, there'd be people <laughs> in your neighborhood that called you a degenerate. Oh, that guy, he closes every Friday to go to the racetrack. <laughs> in Hot Springs, they expect you not to be open on Friday afternoon because <laughs> they're at the racetrack, you know? Um, yeah. And that was I, that was great to be around that kind of atmosphere. And, and I think uh, Lexington really gives you that feel, too, because everywhere Absolutely. you go, there's horse pictures on the wall, and you run into people that were just at the races. Uh, they still got their programs with them and stuff like that. But I, I was able to visit Hot Springs and go to the races, and, and I agree with you that it's, it's a really nice track. It gives the horsemen a good feeling, and it's one of those tracks that they really appreciate horsemen. And in, in turn, the horsemen like to go there, like, they like to be there, and they like to run their horses. Obviously, now the purses are really good. They had to drop down a little bit this year due to the casino being closed and rebuilt right. and stuff like that. But uh, overall, with the very good purse structure at Oakland Park, the high quality of racing and the management that really caters to horsemen. I think uh, you're right. It's, it's a nice venue and um, you know, it's, it's got a nice feel when you're there. It's very welcome. Absolutely, absolutely. And as far as, you know, you mentioned, you know, Lexington as being that kind of town. Absolutely. I mean, it's like the horse capital of the world. And for me, um, as somebody who's been known to uh, speculate on the outcome of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of dirt and turf um, equine contests, any, 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 any town or city that has not only a drive through Starbucks, but a drive through betting window, I'm okay <laughs> with that town. That You know I'm going to like that town. I don't care what else is happening there. That's enough yeah. for me to say, yeah, that place is all right in my book. And uh, Yeah, uh, you got to love Keeneland. You go through the ATM, then you hit the drive through betting, and if you're good to go. Right. It's amazing. I mean, I mean it's the main man of war lane, secretary of lane, all the, the streets. You, you, you got to love it. Now, Everywhere you go is farm. So no, it's, it's right. good. So um, yeah, no. how, how do you, how do you see this weekend? Uh, who do you like in the three-year-old races? Well, I, I, I haven't handicapped them enough to have, have, have an opinion on that, but I will mention something about the fountain of youth that I think is, is worth mentioning. Um, but before we get to that, I think that, you, you know, <clears throat> I'm excited to see essential quality come back. All right. I'm not a big believer. And I know the statistics on the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and the Derby winners, and I know how few there were and 
you, you know, that whole, oh, you, you, you know, most horses don't win the juvenile and win, win, win the derby. I get all that. But I'm not a big believer in these kind of stats, you know, because, uh, you know, like football teaches us on any given Sunday, it doesn't matter. If this is the year that the juvenile winner is going to win the derby, then if you didn't do it in the past hundred years, it doesn't really matter if I'm betting on this particular year, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't pay much mind to that. So I, I thought essential quality was a uh, no pun intended quality horse from his debut. He showed me something in his debut that I thought really set him apart. <clears throat> he had, he came off the pace in his debut, which I always think is, is disadvantageous for a first time starter. Um, I think it's a lot easier to run on the lead or be sitting second in the clear and win first time out than it is to have to come off the pace, pass horses and do what he did, which was down the stretch. He had to go between horses, then angle in and re-rally and kind of come up. And I said, you know, I'm going to make a note in, in, in tracking trips and in my, my, my formulator um, that this horse has got some courage and some raw talent. You know, because that, mm -hmm. that's one of the things I look for. So my, my main thing about watching the Southwest is to see if, in my opinion, he's gotten better at three. Because we see a lot of horses that are early developers and for some reason don't go forward or don't get better at three. A lot do, but a lot don't. And, and sometimes it's surprising, Jeff, and, and you may have insight into why this is, but I noticed that sometimes it happens with good horses. And I attribute it to, well, they've just developed so much faster. There's not a lot of room for them to really go forward. Where are you going to go <laughs> off running, you know, fives and sixes on the ragazins or, or zeros on the thoroughbred? you know, when you're two when, to when you're three, you know, there's just no, no room to go forward. They almost have to level or, or even regress. So what I look for with a horse like Essential Quality, who I'm assuming is, 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 you know, high caliber, I look for them to go forward. I look for them to be better than they were at, at, at two in their very first race at three. And I take into consideration, this is not the end goal. Uh, you know, they may not be fully cranked up but I still think a good horse that's gone forward will run better in their three-year-old bout than their best two-year-old race if they're on the right track and really developing in the right way. Uh, and that, 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 so that's what I'll be looking for and watching for in the Southwest. Did this horse get better? And if he did, he's a serious threat for the Roses in May. And if he didn't, he's not. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think that, uh, you know, you, you forget that two year olds are pretty young. And when you go two or four months in a racehorse's career, I mean, that's like. Uh, that's a big, big time frame, that two to three year old transition. So, yeah, I mean, they can get bigger, stronger and you just, uh, you know, and then the freshening, too. Sometimes they horses come out really good fresh. So we'll, we'll see. But I, I think I, I like that horse quite a bit. Yeah, no, me, me too. He hasn't dis disappointed at all. I thought his race in the juvenile like at Keeneland was a, a huge race, but I'm actually, um, and maybe a little selfishly, I'm more excited about the Fountain of Youth because the Fountain of Youth has a horse in it that is kind of under the derby radar and he really shouldn't be because he's a, a Breeders' Cup winner, but it was on the turf. <laughs> Um, I'm a big fan of Fire at Will, Mike Maker's two-year-old that won the, the won the juvenile turf. And I said after he won the juvenile turf, and I think I even wrote an article about it. I'm, I don't know whether it was in a video or an article. But I'm like, I hope they point this horse and take a shot at the Kentucky Derby because I just think he's that kind of horse, in my opinion. And nobody was talking about him until about two weeks ago when they said he's going to run into fountain of youth, you know? Uh, but I've been kind of, uh, you know, eyeing him and I write this little thing uh, about Kentucky Derby radar. And he's been, you know, in my top three or four since I started at the beginning of the year. And, uh, you, you know, I think he can run on anything. He did win an off the race, off the turf race up at Saratoga, not against much, but shows me he can handle the dirt and he's a kitten's joy. And I think they run on anything kittens joys. And, yeah. um, you know, I think the distance is going to be no problem. He's got a nice, a nice burst to him. He's got everything that I look for 
you know, in, in, in an early derby kind of prospect, he checks all the boxes for me. And I think we'll find out a lot more about him uh, on Saturday. And uh, a, an interesting thing happened. Kendrick Carmouche, who doesn't really write a lot for Mike Maker, got the call. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a strange choice for, for Mike. And Kendrick, I love. I think he's a f- phenomenal writer. I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves. And I was very happy to see him get a call like this. And I'm assuming that he went to Kendrick because he knew if the horse is good, Kendrick will probably give him that kind of stick, you know, mm-hmm. stick, stick with him kind of commitment <laughs> where if you get one of these top riders at Gulfstream, they'll give you a one and done kind of call, but they're still <laughs> playing their options for the Kentucky Derby, you know, yeah. um, because they know their phones are going to be ringing from, you know, Todd Pletcher, Chad Brown, Bob Baffert, and you know, you know, all, all these other guys that are, are, are high profile. So I like everything I see. I don't know that the Gulfstream track is going to really suit him, but the fact that he's there, um, I'm excited about. And, and I'm uh, probably as excited to see him run as anybody. And Maker's been doing, he's been on hitting on all cylinders. So, um, yeah. you know, he's been doing really well at Gulfstream. So uh, there's no reason why that horse can't fit in. And I, and I agree with you. Uh, the turf horses can can sometimes handle the main track and those kitten joys you know they run so good on grass that sometimes people don't try them on the dirt but uh i'm with you you know an athletic horse that can get over the track and has a nice burst like that i think uh i think he's going to have a good shot this this weekend yeah no i agree and that is an interesting thing happening tomorrow um only because we spoke about it i would be remiss if i didn't bring it up known agenda the todd pletcher horse that i liked in the tampa bay race to <laughs> sam davis shows up in an allowance race at gulfstream tomorrow without john velasquez <laughs> yeah so um you know uh, we said we didn't want to mark him off just yet so right. um you know i think it, i think uh, let's hope he gets an outside clean trip and if he gets right. that then we'll get to see what he's really made of. I think he was maybe a little claustrophobic down on the inside and just didn't get to run his race. You know, we both saw that huge gallop out from him and uh, you know, Todd's going to have everything ready to go and, and uh, he's going to get his, hopefully get his confidence back and then allowance race is the place to do it. Right. And that's kind of what I thought. I said this, you know, if he's as good as I thought he was, this should be a confidence builder and he mm-hmm. should be able to handle it. No problem. And take that step forward and show that he belongs you know, in some of these point races going forward. And if not, then, you know, he's probably just not that, that, that kind of horse. And, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll find that out sooner than later. Cause like I said, he's in, a, in an allowance race tomorrow, I believe. So mm-hmm. um, that, that's where he showed up now. Um, interesting topic. And uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it, it's something that I've grappled with for a, a, a long time. I'm an animal lover and I'm involved in rescue and you, you know, I often have concerns about my my love for racing when I see things that I don't feel are in the best interest of horses. And unfortunately, in any sport and any time you deal with animals, everybody doesn't feel the way I do and, 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 and the way you do. And, you, you know, there are, there are people out there that treat horses as commodities and property and, you know, business property. And, you know, I'm not okay with that, you know. Uh, I've always grappled with that, but to take it a step further, the claiming game, I have always thought has some inherent issues as far as um, wanting a horse with the hope of losing the horse. That tells me that there's a, a, a possibility that you're running a horse that maybe shouldn't be running, okay? And I'm not saying there's not a reason you may want to lose a horse that is okay to run. And I know some of these high profile athletes like, you know, Chad Brown and Todd Pletcher drop horses in all the time that they pay 200 and 300, well not them, their owners pay two, three, 400,000 for. But if they're not high quality stakes horses, they're willing to write one off for 20, 25, 50, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, I notice a lot of times they geld them so they don't wind up, you know, making a, making a huge mistake, which can happen to anybody. We know they humble everybody mm-hmm. horses. But I used to grapple with that. And I think that the voided claim rule, and you can probably explain it better than I, has kind of cut into that, you know, especially with the higher purses, you know, the higher purses to me say, okay, 
well, now I could maybe run a horse for a little bit less than I would have had to run them before because the purse is so high. And if I lose them, I, I wind up okay, you know? So, you, you know, does the voided claim rule, in your opinion, prevent and discourage um, an outfit that might be so inclined to do that to run a horse that maybe maybe shouldn't shouldn't be be running? And 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 another part of that question is how tough is it for a trainer to get a horse that might be a little iffy past the vet? Yeah, in in the jurisdictions that have the voided claim. Um, a lot of times, you know, all the tracks have the morning pre-race vet checks. So as you say, they got to be sound and healthy to, to get by the, the, the vet to be able to run that day. So going in, a person that's claiming says, well, they must have passed the morning vet check. So the horse is pretty sound and he's ready to go. But whenever you see, especially a big barn, like you said, a big barn, it doesn't affect it as much when they're dropping a horse, you know, 40,000 down to 10,000 or 12,000 down to 3,000, whatever that big drop might be, or a, an ex stakes horse being dropped down, you know, and that's, that's always a bummer. I, I hate to see that. But the thing is, with a big barn, they can kind of gamble because they almost scare you off and you don't want to claim the horse because you're afraid you're going to have damaged goods. But I think this voided claim, which is in some tracks, I think it's working pretty good. What happens is, if let's say you won the race. So you, you won the race, but the horse ended up sore, lame, it didn't pass the vet exam, and so it became a voided claim. So you'd get that horse back. Not only would that you get that horse back, but the horse is sore because it didn't pass the voided claim, and you now have to get it off the work it, get it off the vet list, and in order to run again. So it just I think the voided claim definitely, it kind of a twofold thing. It tries to protect the horses so they're not dropping and running sore horses. And the other thing is, I think it helps the people that are claiming they don't come in, maybe a new client, it's his first horse, he wants to get uh, some action. So he wants a claiming horse as opposed to a younger horse. And because he gets that first claim and it comes out lame and he, he just lost all his money. The horse gets retired. You know, God forbid he gets fatally injured. And um, now he's got a sour taste about horse racing. And he says, I don't want to do it anymore. So I think this voided claim helps people dropping sore horses knowingly. And also it protects some of the new or existing clients that are claiming horses. So they just don't get stuck with really bad horses, um, you know, injured horses. So I, I, I think the voided claim definitely helps. Um, and, you know, as a handicapper, you know, when you see a, a top trainer, they can drop the horses and, and play. They can gamble a little. But whenever you see a smaller barn drop a horse, that's kind of a rarity. You know, then, you know, that always to me seems like, well, they're a small barn. They don't have a lot of horses for them to be dropping that horse. is probably a, a, a more uh, something going on there. So, you know, we have always have to try and read between the lines, whether we're a trainer claiming for an owner or we're handicapping and we want to bet on that horse. Right. And, 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 and I get all that. And one of the things I do as a better is I try and, and, and study trainer habits and different barns and, you know, what they do and what, the, what, what they don't do. I remember there was a, 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 a trainer years ago. Um, I'm pretty sure he passed away now. He was a, a very sharp claiming trainer. And, he, he, you know, I noticed that when he would drop a horse that he wanted to lose, um, he would run him without front bandages. And when he, when, when he didn't want to lose him, he'd run him with front bandages. Because when they saw the front bandages on a drop, everybody said, oh, something must be wrong. He added fronts to, you know, to this horse. And he was just sneaking him by. It was a betting barn and he would, he would sneak him by. Um, so he kind of did the opposite of what you would think that you know, people would do um, in that. But you, know, you said a couple of things that kind of, kind of strike that nerve with me. You know, you mentioned, you know, you could be worried about damaged goods or worried about, uh, you know, a sore horse. So even with the voided claim rule, that's a consideration. So is that a consideration that would be eradicated completely if we didn't have claiming races and did it more the way they do it um, in some jurisdictions in Europe where, 
you know, they run for certain classes or, or certain, you know, values. And then they have sales throughout the year where you can buy one of these horses where you're allowed to vet them and check them out and kind of know what you're buying. Is that a, is that a safer, better system for the horse? Or are people going to just do it anyway because they're running for the purse money and they're going to sneak one by and try and, and make money off the horse? I, I, mean. I think that if you are going to, you know, if you went to this tiered system like A, B, C, D classes, and at the end of the day, after you run this horse, he's, he's not 100%, and then you run the race, he's probably going to be a little worse than he started, and you know that there's no chance of him getting claimed, you're probably uh, less likely to run the horse because you're only going to make your own problem worse. I think sometimes uh, trainers will say, or owners, they'll say, hey, let's just drop them in, let's lose them, get rid of them, whatever, and move on. Like you said, I mean, sometimes the big stables are making room for next year's two-year-olds, and other times an owner's just a little frustrated with the horse. He didn't run like they'd hoped. But I, I think it's always, as a trainer, and nobody wants to have a horse get injured on the track. And we also got to look out for the, the safety of the jockeys because it's, I don't think it's fair to them to send a horse out that might have a problem. And uh, then, you know, some, we know horses go down and the jockeys get hurt. So we don't want to have that. And um, so I think the tiered system, like they use in Europe, um, their class levels, and they, they're not really, there's not a lot of claiming. They don't have many claiming races in, in, in what I've seen from some of the European uh, jurisdictions. But uh, yeah, I think if you were still going to take that horse to your barn at the end of the day and it was 100% because there was no claiming, I, I think you would give that horse time off and rest it and rehab it if it had still some chance to be uh, productive in your stable. And I think with that system, it, it, they, they might do that. But you and I know how old school racing is. To have something new come in is very difficult. And to have people change their ways and come to a new system, um, on one hand, I think it's going to be a very hard sell. On the other hand, uh, maybe we get to the point where, you know what, we're forced to do it. We need to make a change. Right. I, mean, I think a lot of, 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 of the changes that we are making in the game, um, and, and a lot of them I think are good, uh, you know, the Horse Racing Integrity Act and, you know, things like that. Not that I'm in favor of government intervention, but I think, you know, we've proven through past performances of all things that we, we, we need some outside intervention. I mean, the biggest uh, racing scandal that we've had in many years, which is the Jason Service Torge Navarro scandal, um, was initiated by the FBI, not by our own policing system and our own testing yeah. and our own stewards, our own thoroughbred protective agencies. Um, you know, they sat back and watched and said, well, we have no proof. There's, no, there's nothing we can do, which is an argument that I've never bought because they can rule anybody off of being undesirable at any time they want. It's a privilege to walk on the ground. So if they really believe you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, they can tell you, you know what? You're not welcome here anymore. You've got no stalls. Goodbye. Yeah, um, there's trainers that I know they've been asked to leave. And I know other exactly. trainers that they've said, uh, we didn't give you any stalls, you know? Exactly, exactly. They, I mean, it's no it's no right to participate in any in any race meet and be, you know, given access to the ground. So I don't buy that argument. Well, we had no proof, so we didn't do anything. Um, I think sometimes it's a double-edged sword. They welcome those entries and kind of maybe, maybe look maybe the other way. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> look as hard, hard as they should, but you know, be that, be that as it may, but I am definitely in favor of a system of racing that prevents that kind of thing from happening to horses and would also stop these state courses that wind up in for, you know, low level claiming prices that should absolutely have earned a, a, a nice comfy, safe retirement um, yeah. for themselves. And I, I applaud anybody who does that. And I'm involved in some of that myself. So with, with, with that said, I don't think it's impossible we get forced to do something like that. We've been forced to address um, the LASIK issue where we've been, everything we do really for the betterment of the sport comes about because we kind of get forced or pressured to do it in one way or another. So if that happens, I'll welcome it and, and, and kind of champion that cause. And, and, and I don't mind being the first one to start talking about it. And I'm sure other people have. I think, you know, I, think it's, 
I think as trainers, you know, anytime you go to say a new jurisdiction, a new track, new rules and regulations, I think people adapt. They learn the new rules. They they learn to work with it. And uh, just like when you go across the country and now all of a sudden you're in a new track and they do things differently. Well, you slowly adapt to doing things differently, just like if you were living in a different country and you just you, you slowly adapt. You do you go with the flow and you, you learn the rules and you just play by those rules. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I said I was in favor of the Horse Racing Integrity Act, and I am. I also said I'm not generally in favor of, of, of government intervention or too much government oversight, which, which I'm not, which is going to lead us to our, our last topic. When it comes to the, you know, the, the Integrity and Safety Act, the Act, I think that we absolutely need it. Um, we need something and we failed on our own to do anything. So lo and behold, let's see what they, someone else can do. And if it happens to be them, then it happens to be them. I think they deserve a shot. Somebody else other than, than the industry deserves a shot. So that's why I support that because I think those changes need to happen. And I think there needs to be oversight, but there's something that the government did to the game that we alluded to in, a, in an earlier show that I think set, um, for lack of a better term, uh, boulder rolling down a mountain that couldn't be stopped and, 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 and kind of led us to where we are today. And, you know, I'm someone who comes from an era in racing where people bred to race and were ultra competitive against each other. You didn't see a lot of partnerships before Dogwood and, and Cot Campbell, you know, I'm talking when, you know, you had the powerhouse, you know, Lexington and, 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 and another area, powerhouse farms and stables, you know, Rokeby Stable, Christiana Stable, uh, Calumet Farm, Green Tree, Farm, you know, all of these big stables, okay, and even owners, C.V. Whitney and, uh, you, you know, they didn't take partners. They didn't want partners. You couldn't buy into one of those horses. I don't care how big your checkbook was, okay? You could come there and offer as much as you want for a sliver of one of those horses. They would laugh at you, okay? Um, they, you know, those were the best horses that money could not buy, okay? You know, that's what uh, nowadays um, so many horses are really bred to go to the sales and run exactly. one, a fast one furlong or two furlong. But when these... Uh, powerhouse breeders and they bred to keep their own and race uh, you know i think these you know i think where you're going is these tax laws that have changed exactly. it really it really hurt um you know these big guys that they were making a lot of money in their businesses and they were able to fund their racehorses through their business but when the tax write-offs changed i think a lot of them just slowly went away and they just kind of got rid of their horses 100%. but uh, the other thing was when with these breeders is not only could they raise them the way they wanted to, they had the foundation mares, they could breed to different stallions, they could bring them along at their own pace. They didn't have to push them to go to a sale and go one or two exactly furlongs right. as fast as you can. So you know how they were raised, you know how they were slowly brought up at their own pace, and then they raced them and, and they gave them time off because they still had a farm and then they'd come back to races. So, and then the good mares would be in back into the broodmare band. And so these big um, big farms had a nice uh, continuum. Keep, keep right. coming. You know, you'd always had good horses coming next year and next year. A hundred percent. And 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 I'll tell you what that that also spawned. Okay, because it gets it gets deeper. I always look to I always like to figure out. Okay, well, what caused it? You know. And now we say, well, all these horses are retiring and they don't last. And yeah, that was always true with a Derby winner. Okay, there was always. Mm -hmm you know, a derby winner or a triple crown winner, it was a good shot. They weren't going to race it for, and that's just economics. You're not going to get around that. But back then we had a lot of the handicap division, as they called it. Okay. The older stakes had 10, 12 horses in them, those, those races. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why? Because those were homebreds that they weren't afraid to take time to develop at three at four and five because even if they got that grade one at four or five or six they were going to breed to one of their mares you mm -hmm. follow me and it was just you know keep that line going keep that farm going you know i laugh all the time when people say well 
you know, Sham was the second best horse in Secretary of the Derby. <laughs> and the second fastest derby ever. I'm not so sure of that. You know who ran behind both of them that day? Forgo. Okay, Forgo is one of the best handicapped horses ever. Carried the weight from seven furlongs to a mile and a half. I've got his horseshoe up there that he wore in the 1977 Met Mile on a wall back there. Um, nice. That I was in, 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 in a barn um, afterwards and it come off and... Uh, I was like, could I have it? Nobody cared. They were like, sure. <laughs> like, you know, um, I got no certificate of authenticity or nothing like that, but I know it's his. I know because I took it right, right off the, uh, the shed roll floor. Um, but that rule and changing, uh, you know, the laws is what started this whole thing um, changing the game, changing the game, how we play it, how we go about it. And uh, I, I think it's unfortunate because those, like you said, those wealthy, wealthy people, um, you know, used uh, their barns and their stables as a hobby and as an offset. And, you know, it fueled the game and fueled, you know, not only the breeding side, but the sporting side of, uh, of the game as well. And uh, I think that's a, 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 a problem that, you know, we've lost. Okay. We, we, lost, we lost you for a second, but you're back now. Okay, gotcha. Let's see if we can. And we're recording again. Okay. I think we're good. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we'll need much, much technical skill for that. I was talking most of the time, and I think we captured we, – we, we captured me. We lo you, you froze for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. But I was talking. And I got your, you, you had the you had the forego shoe that nobody really cared. You said <laughs> right. Yeah, I took it off the shed row floor. You know. So, um, but I, <laughs> I, I, I think that when you know that all all changed. You know, when the IRS changed those laws and forced these farms to treat their stables, you, you know, as a separate business entity that was designed to make money not be a write-off for other businesses and other sources of wealth and income and it's it, it it changed the whole game i mean it it started the retirement of the older horses and of the non-derby winners you, you know and it just mm -hmm. it, it changed the game in my my opinion for, for the worse yeah i know out on the west coast where i you know watched the likes of Charlie Whittingham and Bobby Frankel. I mean, they, they just made their, you know, those older horses were, they just, boom, they just kept going and going. And uh, like you said, they were training for some of the breeders that um, they weren't afraid of breeding for route races and they weren't afraid right. of beating breeding strong bone and, and longevity you know a lot of times nowadays horses they got to have that speed and if they don't have that speed they're not going to sell in the sales so they might be limited in they're not going to be able to race at a mile and a quarter our classic uh distance here in america right. and, you, so you know, I, go ahead no go ahead i was just gonna yeah say I, th I think that uh, you know it was nice to watch that but like you said Nowadays, I mean, our handicap division, uh, especially even on the West Coast, I mean, you put up a million dollars in the Del Mar, the Pacific Classic, and, and they might get five, six, seven horses. And, uh, right. you know, and they're two just or three of them. Two or three of them are barely state horses. Yeah. And they sh and a couple, one or two might have shipped out from uh, back east. So, yeah, the handicap division is, uh, you know, like you said, it's definitely kind of been diluted uh, through what, what we could say is, you know, that people, these breeders said, you know, we're, we can't use it as a tax write-off, so we can't fund it the way we used to, and it's just going to cost us too much, and uh, so then they slowly went away, and, um, you know, farms stopped having the, you know, breeding of year after year, and having their own horses. Uh. Right, and it's, it's not the farms, Jeff, you know, because the, 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 the breeding farms are going to breed what people buy, they're in business. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, the owners, the yeah. owners that had exactly. their it's the owners, stables, right? Yeah. It's the owners and the bloodstock agents and the trainers that are steering people to to, to these type of horses. <laughs> and why they do it, I don't understand. Because you know, you go to the sale, and everybody wants that horse that worked, you know, one or two furlongs, blistering fast. You you know, I don't want that horse. Probably, you know, how many yeah. of those no, wind I, up the good ones down the line? Yeah, and um, it's it's kind of like when they used to run two furlong races. I said I don't think you'll see any of these horses in these two furlong races running in the 
Kentucky Derby next year. <laughs> I don't think any of them ever very did. Very rare. Yeah, I don't think any yeah. of them ever did. Nope. You, you know. No, nope. um, and so, uh, so and and what I look for in those sales is, you know what? I like a horse that's a nice mover that doesn't work as fast, but he keeps on going, and he's a nice mover, and he's more affordable because I can't compete absolutely. with the the big guns of the high dollar horses. That, like you said, everybody's on those big horses. You know. Listen, if I won Powerball on Wednesday, mm-hmm. and then won it again on the next Wednesday. And then won it again on the next one day. That three power balls in a row. That probably makes me a billionaire twice. <laughs> I still wouldn't go try and outbid these guys on those horses. I yeah. still buy the you know five horses for two hundred thousand instead of the one for a million dollars. Yeah, I get you. Back. And I think horse racing is you know can be a numbers game, and uh, you know you gotta you got to hit the right number and have that lucky horse. And just like we said, this, this weekend, the three-year-olds are running and uh, I hope they continue to do well and stay healthy and, and make their way all the way to May. And it's really nice to see Oakland be able to be back up and running after a couple of weeks of delay. You know, the weather has been really tough around the Midwest and uh, it's just fingers crossed that they get a nice healthy day. The horses run good and uh, we get to see who some of these next Derby horses are. Absolutely excited about essential quality and even more um, for personal reasons, excited about fire at will uh, and see how he stacks up and we get a little bonus. We get to see how, how right or wrong I was about this known agenda horse tomorrow at at, (laughs) at golf streaming that a little, little allowance race that I will be watching closely. So uh, always a pleasure, Jeff. Yep. Uh, Same here always. So um, until next time, we'll, uh, we'll be, coming up with some issues or things that you guys want to hear if not you can also shoot us some comments and we're happy to take up the conversation of whatever you think uh, is going on in horse racing or you want us to take a deep dive into but uh for jeff metz and john thank you for watching absolutely Uh, ciao for now everybody and we're sorry for our little technical glitches there um it happens technology Uh yeah ciao Ciao for now bye-bye Reach the starting gate, it's post time. Cold front, the favorite comes forward. And they're into the stretch, cold front put to the test. Cold front does it again. Back in the field of the afternoon.